Hey everybody, this is Vince Miller. Thank you so much for joining me for this time. Today we're gonna to be speaking to the overarching subject of men's ministry from a high level. I'm gonna present you with five questions that I think will help you as you either start or build or maybe revamp the men's ministry in your church. And I think this will be very helpful for you to think through some of the details that you might even be planning or need to revamp. Uh, today I'm gonna focus on building a culture around men in your church. Not a lot of the programmatic details, just the cultural things. I think these questions will help you to think through the small changes that could have a massive and a very large impact on your entire church around a culture of men. Today, I'm gonna to present this in a question format because I, I think it's gonna cause some reflection for you. So I'm gonna give you five questions followed by five actionables that are very, very simple. And this is what I would do if I was consulting with your church or your pastor or your men's leader. So here are the five questions. Number one, are you confusing secular views on masculinity with biblical views on manhood? Are you confusing how the world looks at men with how the Bible looks at men. We do this all the time. Here's a text for you today. Uh, Paul is writing to Timothy, who is now in Ephesus, and he's pushing him to stay there for a very particular reason. First Timothy chapter one, here's what he says. As I urged you when I was going to Macedonia, remain, stay at Ephesus, so that you may charge certain persons not to teach any different doctrine. So we see there's some doctrinal issues here. Nor to devote themselves to myths and endless genealogies which promote speculation rather than the stewardship that is from God and by faith. Now this is important, a very important moment for Paul to Timothy because what has happened in the church at Ephesus is that uh, some of the people in Ephesus have brought in secular worldviews into the church and have blended them with Christianity. And so what does Paul want him to do? He wants him to address the fact that he has done this. And I think we do this when it comes to men. We confuse men because we bring social constructs of masculinity and bring them into the church and say, that's what a man is. We do this all the time. We confuse it all the time. For me, masculinity is very simply a social construct. It is a view of manhood from society, from the world, and it's constantly moving, as we can see. Identity among the gender species today is, const is a constant moving thing. But when we read the Bible, there is a view on manhood, biblical manhood. And you know how I know this is true? Because, well, if you want to understand men, you just have to go back to the creator of man to understand it. And he has a prescribed way for us to become men. He created us. After all, you don't go to the world to understand men. You go to God to understand men. But when we confuse these and conflate these two ideas on masculinity with manhood, we confuse men. And they run from it because they know and can smell that something is wrong. So you got to stop blending these ideas together. Constructs from the world on masculinity with biblical manhood and declare what it is. So here's your first actionable. Build a culture of biblical manhood. So the next question is obviously, well, how do we do this and how do we build it? Number two, question number two, are you consistently showing people the manhood of Jesus? That's the next question because that leads us to a view of man. Are you consistently showing your church and people and men the manhood of Jesus? Here's a text for you. I think this one's crazy cool. It's very simple, but something we often pass over. 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 5, reads something like this. For there is one God and one mediator between God and man. The man, the man, Christ Jesus. That's it. We got to show him the man. I mean, Paul was constantly preaching a message about Jesus and he was focusing on Jesus. Why? Because he is the prototype for all men. I mean, we do this all the time. We complain about who men are, but we don't show them who men are meant to be. Well, if you're complaining about who men are today, then show them the man, Jesus Christ. Show them who they are meant to be. As we understand it, Adam 
was created, but he was the imperfect man and every man since. Jesus is the perfect man, and we need to show that to all men, that he is the prototype. So let people see the delta between us and his perfection and his character. And you have to consistently preach about Jesus and let people see his character so that they, they will see their sinfulness and see that they need Jesus. There's your second action. Show men the man, Christ Jesus. Question number three. Are you simply entertaining men or are you training them? Are you entertaining men or are you training them? Here's a text for you from John chapter 6. This is a crazy moment. Jesus has just fed the 5,000. Uh, we know that he kind of snuck away from this, walked across the sea onto the other side to Tiberias. As he is over there, he's kind of roaming around, and now the 5,000 wants to know where he went. They find him. Okay, They found him on the other side of the sea, and they said to him, Rabbi, uh, when did you come here? Jesus answered them, truly, truly, that's amen, amen. I say to you, you are seeking me not because you saw signs, but because you ate your fill of the loaves. You ate food. That's why they want him, because he gave them food. Do not work for the food that perishes, but for the food that endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man will give to you. The Son of Man, there it is will give to you. We're seeing the Son of Man here, right, in this moment, right? So what is Jesus doing in this moment? Well, kind of in some ways, he's kind of entertained their fancies. He, he's provided them with what they needed, food, right? An epic moment of food, by the way, but why did he do it? He didn't do it just, just to provide them food. He did it to train them, to show them something, but they don't get it because they just want more food. This is the problem with events sometimes. <laughs> what you win them with is what you win them to, right? If you give them entertainment, they want more entertainment. It's just like these guys here. So stop just entertaining men. Train them. Jesus understood this. Now, I know men like events. I understand it. Everything that we do in men's ministry is based around an event. But if an event doesn't serve a purpose to train men, then you have lost the purpose altogether because, like I said, what you win them with will be what you win them to, and they're just going to want more of that. Therefore, they're going to want more entertainment and more entertainment and bigger entertainment and bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. That's all they're ever want, going to want. So stop entertaining men without a focus on training. Everything needs to focus on training and discipleship. You need to qualify your men. In fact, if we go back to 1 Timothy, we discover that actually Paul is going to have to retrain these men. He's going to have to push some people out of the church, correct some men, and then retrain some men. And the entire letter to Timothy is based in the fact that Timothy is going to have to train and qualify some men. So there's your actionable. Number three, you got to train and disciple some men. Now, we, that might be a program a little bit there, but it's an important program. Number four, question four. Are you consistently calling out men from the largest platforms that you have to God's work? Are you consistently calling out men from the largest platforms that you have to God's work? Love this Old Testament moment in Exodus chapter three. You will too. God is calling out Moses from a very big platform. But Moses said to God, as he tells him that he's going to go, and free the people from bondage in Egypt. But he said to God, who am I that, that I should go to Pharaoh and bring the children of Israel out of Egypt? He said, but I will be with you. God uses his name, but I will be with you. And this shall be the sign for you that you that I have sent you, that when you have brought the people out of Egypt, you will serve God on this mountain. Now, I really think this is an incredible moment. Why? Because God takes a very big flat, big platform and calls out a man who is disqualifying himself into a very big moment. Phyllis, you need to do this with men. You need to speak directly to men, calling them out regularly from the platform. And I'm talking about the platform in your church right now, if you have a church or whatever that platform might be for you. You need to consistently call them out because these men disqualify themselves just like Moses did here. And these call outs, they don't need to be long. They don't need to be whole sermons, 
but they need to be moments, moments that we care enough to stop and talk about a man. For example, if you're preaching a sermon on a Sunday morning, you can take a second to stop a sermon and turn to the men and directly address them around maybe a word that caught your attention that will call out men. Oh, there, I found this word here in the Greek. Here's the word, it's porneia. This comes from the word pornography. Gentlemen, if you're stuck in pornography today, you need to seek Jesus. He is the man who redeems all men. That's a short call out, but it shows that you actually care about men. Here's your action bullet. Call out men everywhere in your church at every level, whether it's youth, middle-aged guys, divorce recovery, uh, celebrate recovery, uh, within the platform of your church, even in women's ministry, call out men everywhere and they will know you care about them and they will respond to that call just like Moses did when God called him out. And question number five, and this is very important, are you giving men an opportunity to be trained and actually to use their spiritual gifts? Are you giving men an opportunity to be trained and actually use their spiritual gifts? Here's a text for you. This is a crazy moment. It's Acts chapter 11. Uh, Paul, who was Saul at the moment, was back in Tarsus for a number of years, somewhere between seven to 10 years. Essentially, we don't know what he's doing, probably nothing. Barnabas, Barnabas, who is in Antioch, finds out where Saul is, Saul Paul, calls him out. And then it says this in Acts chapter 11. And when he, Barnabas, had found him, Saul, he brought him to Antioch, which Antioch was going to become the epicenter for the church to the Greek world for a whole year. A whole year they met with the church and taught a great many people. So they're teaching, they're practicing. And in Antioch, the disciples were first called Christians. So what happens here? Well, Barnabas gives Saul an opportunity to use his gifts to impact the kingdom. And because of that, guess what happened? The entire Roman world was evangelized. <laughs> I don't know why we're not doing this anymore. Men need to be called out into training, periods of training, and then sent to do God's work. You can't just let men park cars and give money. If there's nothing else for them, they're never going to use their gifts or learn to use their gifts. I really believe we've got to stop holding men back, even young men. We've got to call them into a season of training and then send them to use their gifts, even if it doesn't have benefit in our ministry or church. <laughs> if there is no place for men to explore their gifts, to be trained, and to be sent from, they're never going to impact the world. And I believe that these are God's men on God's mission for God's glory. And I want to participate in that, and so do you. So here's your action with this one. Give men an opportunity to use their gifts. Just let them use their gifts. And fellas, if you try these five questions out and these five actions, I promise that they'll start helping you to think through what you're doing and how you're impacting men for his glory and not your own. Hope this has blessed you. If it has, share it with someone else. I'll see you back here next time.